Do you know how to develop a theory of change? A theory of change can have so many benefits. For example, it can help you identify what data you should be collecting. It can also help you articulate to others, like funders, um, why you chose to collect the data you are collecting and how your activities ultimately lead to the changes you want to see. That's why in this video, I'm going to be outlining the steps you can take to help you develop your own theory of change. I want to make sure you're not overwhelmed, but instead feel confident in your ability to use and get data. That's why I'm creating this series of videos. So if you like this, make sure to like and subscribe so that I can keep making more. My name is Michelle Molina, and I have helped a lot of organizations develop their own theory of change. For example, last year, I helped Bright Beginnings community action teams develop their theory of change, and I'm going to be using those theories of change this year to identify or start thinking about what information would be truly meaningful for them to collect. If you watch to the end of the video, I'll tell you how to gain access to a guide I created on developing a theory of change. Before we jump into the steps, I want you to consider who should be part of this process. Basically, you want to bring stakeholders that are very familiar with the initiative you are going to develop a theory of change around to help you create this theory of change. Remember, People help support what they help create. So if you include people in the process of developing a theory of change, you'll not only probably get a theory of change that is, or a theory of change that reflects your stakeholders' perspectives, but you'll also get more buy-in. So the first thing you wanna do is pick a focus. So a theory of change can be done at pretty much any level of an organization. You can create a theory of change for your whole initiative, or you could create a theory of change for a very specific project. You want to pick the focus so that you're um, having this conversation with a clear understanding of what your boundaries are. The second step you want to do is brainstorm outcomes. Outcomes are the changes you want to see. You might ask yourself, what do we want to accomplish because of the, the work we do? Or what, do, what benefits do we want our community to see because of these activities? Basically, you want to brainstorm as many outcomes as you can. Sometimes it's useful to think of the categories these changes might fall into. Some common categories are changes in knowledge, changes in attitude, and changes in behavior. If you're doing systems change, you might categorize them based on the sorts of levers that might change. For example, I've talked about this in the past, but some systems change levers include changes in policies, changes in practices, changes in resource flows, changes in the connections or relationships that exist in your community, changes in the power dynamics, or changes in the mental models. If you don't have clear activities, this is the step where you might want to pause and prioritize the outcomes you have brainstormed and consider what sort of activities might lead to those key outcomes. The next thing you want to do is list your activities. Activities are the things you do. They are um, the things that are being implemented, the things your staff or volunteers spend their time on. The next thing you want to do is draw a connection between the two. So look at the list of activities you have and draw connections to the outcomes you think will happen because of those activities. Sometimes it's helpful to categorize your outcomes based on whether or not they are going to happen in the short term, intermediate term, or long term. Short-term outcomes are outcomes you think will happen as soon as an activity is done. Intermediate-term outcomes are outcomes that are triggered because those short-term outcomes took place. These sorts of changes are probably more broader and you might contribute to as opposed to directly cause. 
And then you have long-term outcomes. These sorts of outcomes are even broader. They are the sorts of changes that might take a long time to happen after an activity takes place, but they're generally triggered because those intermediate term outcomes took place and you might contribute slightly less to them, but you still believe that because of the work you did, you'll ultimately get there. If you have understood the steps I have shared with you up to this point, I want you to let me know by typing yes in the comments below. The next few steps that I'm going to share with you can be basically summed up by saying that you should always be looking at your theory of change and identifying ways you might be able to improve or clarify how you believe change happens. And before we jump into those steps, I just want to reiterate that, you know, a theory of change is a working document, like I said, and you should always be looking for ways to improve upon it. The hope is that you develop a theory of change that will help you identify outcomes that are measurable so that you can actually collect data that is meaningful and that you will be able to then use that data to make course corrections. Additionally, it should help you articulate to other stakeholders how you believe change happens and why you think it's important for you to do the activities you are doing and hopefully enable them to be better able to tell you their perspective on how change might be better able to happen so that you can collaborate better and work towards a shared mission. The next thing you want to do is to consider your assumptions. Now, assumptions are um, beliefs we hold without any evidence. You can think of assumptions as potential blind spots. Some assumptions are safe to make, while others are potentially problematic, and you should consider collecting data to ensure that they hold true. For example, I'm making this video with the assumption that YouTube will be in existence when I get around to posting it and that I will be able to share it with you. I think that assumption is pretty safe to make. On the other hand, I'm also making the assumption that I'm sharing with, um, I'm sharing valuable information with you that you uh, will be able to use. And I don't know if that's true unless you like and subscribe to this channel. Um, but what I want to point out is that some assumptions are safe to make, while others you should probably collect data on to ensure that you are actually uh, have an assumption that is true. There are a number of questions that you might be able to ask yourself to help draw out assumptions, and I have a list of some questions in the guide I'm going to share with you later. Um, but the goal here is for you to identify assumptions, uh, keep a running list of them if possible, and flag the ones that are potentially problematic that you need to collect data on or probably should collect data on. I'll share some questions with you, and if you want some more, be sure to download the guide I'm going to share with you later. For example, one question you might ask yourself is what evidence do you have that the activities you are being implemented the way they should be implemented? Do you have any evidence of that? Another question you might ask yourself is what beliefs led you to pick the activities you picked and whether or not you have evidence that those beliefs are true? And the final question or thing I'd share with you is to look at your theory of change and the connections you just made in the last step and to consider if any of those connections are assumptions and whether or not you can or should collect data to ensure that those assumptions are true. The next thing you want to do is to consider your stakeholders perspective. You can do this by doing a stakeholder analysis. And I'm creating a video describing that process, so stay tuned for that. Um, generally speaking, you want to consider what outcomes are most important to your stakeholders and review your theory of change to see if you're including those outcomes, and if not, consider how you might incorporate them into your theory of change. You can also take a draft of your theory of change and share it with stakeholders and get their perspective or feedback on it. Next, you want to review your model and identify potential leaps. 
And what I'm talking about here are potential leaps in logic. The metaphor or analogy I really like to use is the one of a riverbank. So imagine that your activities are on one side of the riverbed and your mission and the impact you really want to have on your community is on the other side of the riverbank. You can think of your outcomes as stepping stones. So your um, short-term outcomes are the first step along the way, your intermediate term outcomes are the second step, and your long-term outcomes are the final step that should ultimately get you to the other side of the riverbank where your mission is. So you want to review your model and ensure you're not making any leaps in logic that leave a potential blank or um, a spot in the river that is not covered with a potential stepping stone. You can review your theory of change and find areas of strengths. So for example, point out the activities that are most important to your work or the outcomes that are most important to your work or the connections that are most important to your work. Make sure that those are down in pact and you are making a very clear logical steps there. You also want to identify potential areas for improvements. So look through your model and consider which activities need to be clarified or which outcomes need to be clarified, whether or not it's reasonable for you to expect um, specific short-term outcomes based on the activities or whether or not it's reasonable for you to expect one outcome uh, if another outcome happens. Next, I want you to find supporting evidence. So look at the claims you're making. That is, in your theory of change, you're saying, I'm doing X activity because I think it leads to outcome A, which I think leads to outcome B, and so on and so forth. So you want to find evidence that supports the claims you're making. Either you can collect data yourself to support that those claims, or you can also look at the research that has already be, been done to see if there's any evidence out there that supports your claims. Doing this will, one, help you um, be able to justify the work you're doing if you're ever asked to. For example, that's what you're doing in a grant application. You're saying, I'm doing X activity because I think it'll lead to these very beneficial things in my community. Having the literature or data on hand to support that will be beneficial in those situations. It can also help you identify uh, assumptions you're making. So you might look at the literature and find that there's another activity people have done that uh, has been more beneficial or has led to these outcomes faster. So looking at the literature helps you identify those leaps and logics you might be making as well. Now that we have talked about the steps, I want to provide some clarifying final comments. Um, one, you want to avoid getting stuck in semantics. A lot of times when we are developing a theory of change in an effort to uh, be, be as clear as possible, we get stuck in determining which word is the best word to use. For example, we might have a discussion with our stakeholders about whether the activity we do is actually mentoring or is it coaching. Those sorts of discussions, you want to wait for those until after you have a draft of your theory of change so that you don't get stuck um, having meetings and meetings upon meetings on just semantics alone. Also, there are a variety of ways to develop a theory of change. For example, I do another activity where that I call a mini theory of change. Uh, and a theory of change doesn't always have to be a diagram or a pathway model like the one we I described in this video. It can also be a narrative. So there are a variety of possibilities here. And finally, a theory of change, I want to remind you all, is a working document. So like I said before, don't get stuck in semantics. Just do the best you can uh, and clarify as you go. If you like this video, I encourage you to download my guide on developing a theory of change. 
I provide more details on each of these steps and I also provide other tips and more guidance on other things you can do to ensure that you're getting data that is meaningful to your organization so that you can make decisions, make improvements, and hopefully show your success using data. Also, if you like this video, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. That's how I know that this content is beneficial to you. Let me know if you've ever created a theory of change before and what that process was like for you. I'm very interested in hearing how it went. Also, I encourage you to watch my other videos where I talk about other data-related topics. For example, I have a video related to this one on how to develop a logic model. So feel free to check those out and stay tuned for more videos.